In the hierarchy of the Imperial Japanese Navy, two names usually steal the spotlight, the Yamato and the Musashi. They were the largest, most heavily armored monsters to ever sail the seas. But there was another ship, a ship with British blood in its veins and 30 years of combat under its belt that was far more dangerous. It was the Congo. While the super battleships like the Yamato sat in port to save fuel, the Congo was the busy bee of the Pacific. It was faster, meaner, and had rained more destruction on American Marines than any other heavy vessel. But on November 21st, 1944, this invincible fortress didn't fall in a grand fleet engagement. It was executed by an invisible assassin in the pitch black darkness of a storm. In just 120 seconds, 1,250 sailors didn't just drown, they evaporated. And the most terrifying part? The ship was killed by its own captain's best tactical decision. This is the story of the ramming effect and the day a 30,000-ton giant drowned in its own speed. The Congo was an anomaly. Launched in 1913, she was the last Japanese capital ship built overseas, constructed by Vickers in the United Kingdom. She wasn't born as a slow, lumbering battleship. She was a battlecruiser. Her design philosophy was simple. Give up thick armor in exchange for blistering, unmatched speed and massive guns. In the 1930s, Japanese engineers performed a massive, reconstructive surgery on her. They replaced her coal-fired heart with high-pressure oil boilers and lengthened her hull. The result was a 30-knot fast battleship, the only one in the fleet capable of keeping pace with the aircraft carriers. By 1944, she was a battle-hardened veteran. But as she retreated through the Formosa Strait after the crushing defeat at Lady Gulf, the Congo was about to learn that in the age of electronics, speed is no shield against an enemy who can see through the dark. The night of November 21st was atrocious. A gale was whipping the sea into a frenzy, and visibility was near zero. To the Japanese commanders standing on the Congo's iconic pagoda mast, the storm was a blessing. They believed no plane could fly and no submarine could aim in this chaos. They were wrong. They were fighting with 19th century eyes in a 20th century war. 40 kilometers away, the USS Sea Lion, a Balao-class submarine, was watching them. It wasn't using binoculars. It was using the SJ surface search radar. To the Americans, the Congo wasn't a hidden ghost. She was a massive, glowing green blip on a screen. Commander Eli Reich of the Sea Lion made a move that defied conventional sub-tactics. Because the Japanese were moving fast, 16 knots, the Sea Lion couldn't catch them submerged. Reich stayed on the surface, pushing his diesel engines to the limit, racing the battleships through the storm. At 2.56 a.m., the Sea Lion unleashed a spread of six Mark 14 torpedoes. The first victim of that night wasn't the Congo. It was her escort, the destroyer Udakaze. One of the torpedoes, intended for the second battleship, missed and struck the Udakaze directly in her forward magazine. In a split second, the 2,000-ton warship vanished. There was no distress call, no wreckage, no survivors. 307 men were instantly atomized by their own ammunition. A heartbeat later, two more torpedoes slammed into the Congo's port side. The hits were bad, but not immediately fatal. They breached boiler rooms six and eight, scalding the crews inside with superheated steam. But the Congo was a 30,000-ton beast. She had survived worse. Captain Shimazaki, fearing the submarine was still out there, made a logical, tactical choice. Maintain 16 knots. Get us out of the kill zone. It was a decision that doomed every man on board. This is where the story shifts from a battle to a tragedy of fluid dynamics. When a ship has a massive hole in its side and it sits still, the water enters at a manageable rate. But when that ship moves forward at 16 knots, about 30 kilometers per hour, it creates what engineers call the ramming effect. Instead of flowing past the hull, the entire weight of the Formosa Strait was being scooped into the Congo's belly. At 16 knots, the hydraulic pressure against the internal bulkheads was equivalent to a sledgehammer hitting the steel every second. The Congo's internal walls were riveted steel from 1913. 
They weren't built for this. One by one, the bulkheads snapped. The flooding spread from the boilers to the engine rooms. As the ship scooped up thousands of tons of water, she began to list. 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees. The damage control teams were trying to shore up the walls with timber, but the ocean snapped the wood like toothpicks. The engines began to drown. 14 knots, 12 knots, 10 knots. The faster they tried to run, the faster they sank. By 5 a.m., the Congo was dead in the water. The tilt was now 45 degrees. Men were sliding across the oil-slicked decks, crashing into railings and equipment. At 5.24 a.m., the laws of buoyancy failed. The 12-story pagoda mast dipped into the waves, and the ship capsized. But the horror had one final act. As the ship turned upside down, hundreds of 14-inch shells, each weighing 670 kilograms, slipped from their racks in the magazines. They crashed into each other. Simultaneously, the superheated boilers touched the freezing seawater inside the hull. The resulting super magazine detonation was so violent, it tore the 30,000-ton steel structure in half. The blast created a massive vacuum in the ocean. The shattered remains of the Congo didn't sink, they were sucked down. In less than two minutes, 120 seconds, the surface of the sea was empty. The suction dragged hundreds of swimming sailors into the abyss with the ship. Out of 1,400 men, only 237 were ever found. 1,250 sailors had vanished into the oil and fire. The sinking of the Congo is a unique outlier in history. She remains the only Japanese battleship ever sunk solely by a submarine. Her death proved that the era of the giant battleship was over. It didn't matter how big your guns were, if an invisible assassin could reach out from the dark and trigger the very physics of your own speed against you. Captain Shimazaki's decision to keep moving was tactically correct to avoid a second attack, but it was scientifically fatal. It transformed a survivable wound into a total catastrophe. Today, the Congo lies upside down in the Formosa Strait, a steel tomb for 1,250 souls who disappeared in two frantic minutes. What do you think? In the heat of battle, with a submarine prowling in the dark, would you have stopped the ship to save it from flooding? Or would you have run like Shimazaki? Let us know your tactical analysis in the comments. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the tragedies of naval history, hit that subscribe button and join us as we decode the files of the world's most incredible outliers.